Dear Lord God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks that we can gather here to honor, praise, and worship you. Lord God, I just pray now that you would allow us to to take a few minutes to just lay down our burdens at the foot of the cross. That we would just leave that there, that it would be it would be free of our minds so that we can hear from you. Lord God, we give you thanks for your mercy and your grace, your unconditional love, your willingness to forgive us no matter what it is that we've done. So Lord God, I just pray now that you would speak through Pastor Randy that, that his words would be your words and, and that our minds and our hearts would be open to hearing those words and more so that our lives would be willing to make a change based on those words so Holy Spirit be here now fill this place move among us and may you receive all the honor and glory in all things in Jesus name Amen Good morning everybody great to see you announcements I want to make. One, two weeks from today, a guy named Bob Lentz is coming. He's an outstanding speaker. Invite friends to come. He's, he's just an inspiration. And I hope that you uh, encourage others to join us for worship. And secondly, we're trying to organize trips with Samaritan's Purse to go to visit um, hurricane-affected areas. Don't know exactly where we would go. They, they have a lot of uh, slots filled, but right now we're working on going the week of November 12th. And I have about 10 people so far in the church that want to go that week, I think. And I'm asking for 15 to see if we can enable us, uh, us to go. Uh, might also be working on a trip during Thanksgiving week. Some teenagers said, hey, if we could go, but I don't know if that's available or not. And also uh, looking at the 3rd of December. So I don't know, but I think we have some people going we probably will have some people going November 12th. Steve and Kyle are going on the 15th, but they had no more room in that time slot. So just want to give you an update on that. My sense is we're going to be going different times throughout the uh, overcoming uh, over the course of the next year. So just wanted to mention those two things. Before I preach today, uh, we're going to see a little video of a conversation between a Sunday school teacher and a student in Sunday school. This is our recruiting uh, effort. If anybody wants to be a Sunday school teacher after seeing this, we want to see you. Here we go. This will be fun. Here we go. So do you believe that song? My God is so big. My God is so mighty. There's nothing that God cannot do from, for me. you believe that? Well, at the end of the message today, that's where I'm going. I want to know if you believe that. That's where we're headed. In the meantime, I want to back up a little bit, back to last week. I've been talking about one scripture the last couple of weeks. It's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, and this is what we read in that scripture. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So I want to talk about that verse, or continue to talk about that verse, but first, two weeks ago, I talked about how we are his masterpiece, right? That's why I'm wearing this shirt. Um, I didn't know I had this shirt. Yeah, I said, well, you, is the other shirt clean? She said, no, it's not, but this is. So I thought, you know the story of Jesus changing water into wine, and when he changed water into wine, they said, boy, the best wine was saved for last, the best shirt saved for last, right? I have another shirt that I didn't know I had, I'm going to wear next week, so you have something to look forward to. But this is just to say to embody the idea, we're a masterpiece. I asked you a couple of weeks ago, right in your ankle, uh, the, the signature of God, the Lord God Almighty, to remind us that just like an artist makes a great piece of art and, and signs that, that in a sense, God signs us. We're a great piece of art. We're a masterpiece. In fact, less, next week, we're going to have an art show to reinforce that value. So if you did anything artistically, 
What's God's unique style? He takes what to make his art? He takes junk. Okay, so if you have any junk art you, can, you made and you want to bring next week or bring during the week so we can put it in display, that'd be terrific. But we, we've had some submittals. All to drive home one point. You're a masterpiece. You're a masterpiece created by God, but why did he create us as masterpieces? It says he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. I talked about that aspect of the, the verse last time where he created us to do good works. He created us to do good things. And I asked you to pray to God last week. Hey, God, what do you want me to do? Because every single day, God has something that he wants us to do for him. And I, I, I said to you, why don't you pray and, and fill out a slip of paper and stick it in a balloon, blow the balloon up and let it lay, lay around your house until you do the thing that God has placed in your heart to do. Talked about that last week. The, the biblical example that I used, the character in the Bible that I used to illustrate the point was Moses in the Old Testament. And Moses, Moses was given a unique thing to do. He was prepared for it, talked about that last week, won't repeat what I said. He was prepared to do a unique thing for God, but the unique thing he was asked to do was this. God said to him, you must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. So that's what God, Moses' job was. So here's what I want to ask you. When you think about the story, Moses leading the people of Israel out of Egypt, what exactly did Moses do? What did he actually do? do to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? And my answer is not very much. He did a small thing, not a big thing, a small thing. For example, first time Moses met the king, Pharaoh, he went in, he was carrying something in his hand. What was he carrying in his hand? His walking stick, a rod. And, and what did God want him to do to demonstrate that God was with him? What was he supposed to do with the walking stick? Drop it on the ground, throw it down. And so he drops in the ground. What happens to it? It turns into a snake. And then what's he supposed to do? Pick it up. Now, that's a little scary. But it's not hard to do. There's not a single person in the room right now that could not hold on to a walking stick and let go of it, right? Everybody here in the room has the physical ability to throw a stick in the ground. Everybody here in the room, maybe not a willingness, but has the ability to pick up a, a snake. We all have that ability. It's not very hard. The, the power is displayed not by what we do, but what, what God does. Well, that didn't work. Didn't persuade the king at all. So Moses came back sometime later, and, and here's basically what Moses did. He just warned the king. He said basically numerous times, 10 different times, he said, you need to let God's people go and if you don't, this bad thing's going to happen to you, right? If you don't let God's people go, the, the Nile River's going to turn to blood. And it happened, and King's heart was hard. And then he came back and he said, if you don't let God's people go, then there's going to be a bunch of gnats, then there's going to be frogs, then there's going to be darkness, then there's going to be the oldest firstborn male in the family and it's going to die. What did Moses do? All he did was say, if you don't let God's people go, then this bad thing is going to happen. That's all he did. Everybody in this room could do that. It's not very much to do. Everybody in the room could do that much. Not very much. What amazing thing transpired is not what Moses did, but rather what God did. If you think about the story at the end of it, Eventually, the king lets the people go. The people leave. And after they're gone, and Moses is, is long since out of the sight of the Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh sits back and he thinks about what just happened. What does Moses say to himself? Uh, what does Pharaoh say to himself? Does Pharaoh say, oh, that Moses guy. He's amazing. That Moses could talk anybody into anything. That Moses could sell ice cream cones in the middle of a snowstorm. Is that what the king says? No, the king's not impressed with Moses. The king's impressed with Moses' God. Moses did a small thing. God did the big thing. And when God does the big thing, whew, then people step back and say, whoa, God. Let me give another example. Mary. What did Mary do? 
angel came to Mary, said, like all angels do, do not be afraid. Then the angel said, you're going to have a child. You're going to conceive a child by the Holy Spirit, and you're going to call that child uh, Jesus. And then Mary responds to that call from God, and this is what Mary says. This is all she does. This is all Mary does. And she raised the child. I get you. I get that. But right now, at this point in the story, all Mary does is to respond by saying, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come through. All she did was say yes. Mary did very, very little. She just said yes. God said, this is my plan, and Mary said yes. That's all she did. Think about Peter. Peter walks in the water. What did Peter do to walk on the water? Here he is. He's in a boat, and he goes like this. And steps out of the boat. Can anybody here do that? Everybody here can do that. It's not very much that Peter did. God did the thing that got everybody's attention. God got the thing, uh, did the thing that was amazing. Peter did very little. Mary did very little. Moses did very little. Why does God, let me go back to the verse. We are God's masterpiece. He's created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. I believe the things that God ultimately wants us to do are often very small things. Why do you think he asks us to do small things? They're scary things, but they're small things. Why does he do that? Listen to this. In, in Gospel Matthew, Jesus says this. Jesus says, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. He says, let your good deeds be seen by other people so people long-term praise God, not you. You know, when I do something... When I do something, you know what I'd rather do? I'd rather do it myself. Anybody here like that? If you had something to do, wouldn't you rather do, do it yourself? Because if I can do it myself, then I don't have to wait on you. you don't have to, then I don't have to put up with you doing it the wrong way. I can just take care of things. You know what? A lot of us are like that. I'd rather do, no thank you, I'd rather do it myself. Some of us are like, many of us are like that, right? I think we're also like that relative to God. I think we'd rather do things without God's involvement. Example, last week I said to you, why don't you pray and ask God what he wants you to do? Some of you may have done that. You may have thought of somebody that's sick and recovering from a hospitalization. And God may have said to you, hey, I want you to cook a meal for this sick person every day for the next two weeks. I want you to give them 14 meals. And that's a lot of work, but it's, it's kind of manageable. It's a lot of work. It's an hour every day, and then I have to deliver it and all that kind of thing. It's a lot of work. But it's manageable because I know how to cook those 14 meals, right? That's your mentality. I can handle that. It's, it's concrete. I can do that, go there. But if I do that, if I make 14 meals for a sick person and deliver them every single day for the next two weeks, and I take them to the person's house and I hand it to them, what are they going to say? They're going to say, when I give them a meal, what are they going to say? Thank you. And who are they going to be thanking? Me. And I kind of like it that way. It's very manageable. It's, it's like all on me. I just have to go and make 14 meals. It takes a lot of work, but I can go and I, I don't have to rely on God. I'd rather do that because it's more manageable for me. And yet that's not the way God wants it to be. Jesus said, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. If I make those meals, who are they going to be praising? Me. Now, there's nothing wrong with making, making 14 meals. That's terrific. That may be from the Lord. But the kind of thing that I'm talking about this morning that gives, causes people to praise God is not me making 14 meals for somebody. Instead, it's where I take a much more, smaller role like Moses and like Mary and like Peter walking in water. All I do is go to the Pharaoh and say, hey, if you don't let the people go, this is what's going to happen. That's a small role. Take some courage, but it's a small role. And, and the Pharaoh comes away from the experience and says, whoa, that guy's God is powerful. See what I'm saying? Listen to this. One more example from the Bible. This is from the Gospel of Luke, ninth chapter. Listen, it says, one day Jesus called together his 12 disciples. And he gave them power and authority to cast out all demons and heal all diseases. Now, question for you. What would you do if you were in this story and you were one of Jesus' 12 disciples and he was speaking to you? Get engaged with me. What would you do? 
Let me reread it. One day, Jesus called his 12 disciples together. That includes you. And he gave them power and authority to cast out demons and heal diseases. And then he sent them, including you, out to tell people about the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. What would you do? But then he gives one additional instruction. Listen to what he says. He says, take nothing for your journey, he instructed them. Don't take anything with you. Don't take a walking stick, a traveler's bag, food, money, or even a change of clothes. Don't take anything with you. So they began their circuit of the villages, preaching the good news and healing the sick. Here's my question. Why did Jesus tell them, don't take a walking stick? Don't take a traveler's bag. Don't take food. Don't take money. Don't take a change of clothes. Why do you think he said that? He wanted them to depend on him. He wanted them to depend on him, not themselves. Here's what I would do. Let's pretend we decide we're going to go on a little mission trip. All right, we're going to go. We're going to go to Mississippi, whatever. We're going to go to Mich or, uh, Houston or wherever. You're going to go on a mission trip. What are you going to do? I'm going to pack my bags, aren't you? I'm going to take stuff along. And you know what? If I really want to be used by God while I'm there, I want to be ready for that. You know what I got an idea of doing? When I go on this mission trip of mine, I'm going to take an extra 500 hours along. I'll tell you why. I'm going to find the money. I'm going to take $500 along so that when I see some needs going on in front of me, I'm going to have $500 in my pocket. And if I see something happening, I can, I can use that money to help that person. How many of you would like that? You, if you have $500, spirit of generosity, how many of you would be comfortable with that? So I'm, I'm out there. I got my $500. I see somebody that's sick. Oh, my goodness. Somebody's sick. Somebody's sick. And so, you know what I ought to do? I get this $500. Here's my opportunity. I found out they're sick. I say to them, hey, God wants me to help you out. Why don't you and I, we go to the doctor. Let's go down to the doctor. We go down to the, together to the doctor. I go to the doctor. I say, doctor, examine this person. I'll cover the bill. Doctor examines, says, they need this medication. I say, I'll pay for that. I got that covered. And I pay for the medication, and the person gets well. Who do they thank? They thank me. Now, of that activity, of that activity, that was a good thing. God made me, a, uh, made me a miraculous or whatever, whatever I am, uh, a masterpiece, and he prepared me to do good things a long time ago. Of that activity of helping that sick person, how much of that was me, and how much of that, what percentage of that was God? What does it look like to the person being helped? In my opinion, it looks like 90% of the good stuff that I did was me. I brought my money. I took them to a doctor I found. I got them the medication and I helped them out. 90% of that was me and 10% was God because we all know, truthfully, that all healing ultimately does come from God. God created substances that become medicines that heal us. God is give, given credit for 10% of it, but the predominance of credit is given to me. What does the scripture say? The scripture says, let your good deeds so shine before people that they see your good works and give praise to the Father in heaven, not to me. And yet when I do that thing, taking my $500 and helping him out, you know what? I'm really comfortable with, aren't you? I really like that. On the other hand, let's say that I see somebody that's sick and I go up to them and I say, hey, you're really sick. May I pray for you? And that person actually is healed. What does that person think? How much of that is to me and how much of that is to God? If I pray for somebody and they're actually healed, how much of that is to me and how much of that? 10% is me. I at least had the courage to pray. Good for me. 90% of that is God. They come away from the experience and they say, oh my goodness, God is real. And it takes them to a place that they never before had gone in their spiritual journey. It's amazing. This is what the scripture says. Jesus said that that's exactly what he wants us to do. Let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your Father in heaven. I'm comfortable giving $500 to somebody to help them out. But that's not what God wants. That's not how God does things. God instead wants me to do less, not more, and depend on him to do the thing that receives the praise. Ephesians 2.10 says this, for we are God's messenger, uh, masterpieces. We're his masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus. He created you 
in Christ Jesus. He transformed your life. He made you fresh and new in Christ Jesus, empowered you by the Holy Spirit to be something else and taking the power that God has attributed to you, you are then supposed to go out and do the good things he's planned for us to do a long time ago. That's God's intention so that people praise not you but God. So what does God do with Moses? God takes Moses says, here, Moses, all I need you to do is make a pitch to the king and I'll do, do the rest. Mary, all I need you to do is give me a yes and I'll do the rest. Peter, all I need you to do is step out of the boat and I'll do the rest. And that's what God wants us to do. So I have a, I have a challenge for you. Let's pretend we take this scripture in Luke 9 seriously. This week, I'd like you to go out and pray with people. Wherever you are. If you encounter anybody sick this week, you go up to them and say, Let me pray. can I pray for you? And you pray for them. How many of us are going to do that? Probably very few. It's just like you might be afraid to pick up the stick that's a snake at this time. We're afraid to step out and pray. And yet that's what God's word commands us to do. He commands us to step out and let himself be in display. And so here's what I, but and yet I don't think you're going to do that. So here's what's come to my mind. You all know that one of the things that really took my faith from wherever it was to wherever it is, one of the significant tr contributors to faith growth in my personal journey is when I started praying for people and seeing people heal. You know, that's a big deal to me, right? That's a big deal, part of my journey. I've told you that many, many, many times. And when I was preparing the thoughts for this sermon, what hit me, what hit me is that in a similar way as my faith was grown through that experience, I think that your faith is going to grow through the same kind of experience. For several years now, I felt burden in my heart that we ought to have a healing service in this church. And when I envisioned this, I always thought it was going to be a Sunday night. I thought it was at the end of Z World. I've thought numerous times for a couple of years, at the end of Z World, we're going to say to all those people, there's 400 people there, hey, this, at the end of this in the tent, we're going to pray for people, people are going to be healed. That's the way I thought it. But when I was putting the sermon together, I really believe God told me, we need to have some healing services and we need to have them here on a Sunday morning in consecutive weeks so that God's power can be put on display right here in this room. And, and what I, uh, I was convicted about is, starting October 22nd, for four weeks in a row, we're going to have healing services here. Four weeks in a row. October 22nd, October 29th, and November whatever, 5th, and November 12th. I think those are the Sundays. We're going to have four healing services in a row. And, and, and I, I'm telling you this because we need to have people come to these healing services that are sick. Now, how many of you know anybody that's sick? Everybody knows somebody that's sick. Everybody knows somebody with problems. We're going to pray for physical sickness. We're going to pray for emotional sickness. We're going to pray for addictive sickness. We're going to pray for relational sickness. We're going to pray for sickness. Everybody knows people that have sickness. And I want to challenge you to, to take just a little bit of courage here and say to somebody, hey, would you be interested in coming to this healing service? And you know what? They might say no. Who cares? Here's the bigger crime. We might have 50 people say no. The bigger issue for me is not all the people are going to say no. It's the, three, it's the 300 people here that won't be asking. The bigger fallacy of this thing, the reason this isn't going to work, isn't because people won't come. It's because you don't have the guts to step up and ask. Shame on you. There's nothing bad about this idea. I believe this has come from God. And you can do the asking. You have to do something real small, just like Moses did. All you have to do is go up to somebody and say, hey, we're having, I'll write it out for you. Here, a piece of paper. Um, 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 my church is having a healing service on October 22nd, 29th, 5th of November. And it's still going to work. It's still going to work. Because God's going to be moving there. You could pray for somebody. I could write a prayer out for you. I could write a prayer out for you. and say, You could see somebody sick. And you could say, hey... Can, can I pray for you? That's the hard part, the easy part. You could just read it. Uh, dear God, please heal this person 
and, and move in their life and, and, and resolve whatever the physical problem is, bring healing. And, and as, I place my, oh, as I place my hand on their shoulder, I pray that you would be working, that this would not be my hand but your hand and that you would heal them. And you could do that. So why don't you do that? Why don't you invite? Because you're scared. You're scared to do that. And Jesus said, I've made you a masterpiece. We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we would do the good things he's planned a long time ago. God has intentions to heal people and, and your part, your small tiny part is to invite. I said to you that God uses us and makes us masterpieces. You know what? Some of you used to be serious drug users. Do you remember those days in your life? Do you remember that? you remember when you used to do things that you weren't very proud of? Those are the junky aspects of your life. And God has taken you and molded you into the person you are today. And he actually wants to use that junk for his glory. That's the masterpiece part. He wants to take your past drug use, whatever it is, and use it. You can invite somebody that's still using or somebody that's still messed up in the way that you used to be messed up and still maybe, maybe occasionally struggle, and he can use that slop of your life to authenticate your request. Hey, I know where you are, as I've been there. God has helped me, and I believe he wants to help you. Would you please come? Because my church wants to pray for you. And we won't put you in a spot. And, and you can tell them, we don't want their money. We don't want their money. If I remember, I will say, hey, is there anybody here today that's come for healing today? We don't want your money. You don't have to put any money. If I remember that, that's the only thing. Remember that. We don't want your money because we don't want your money. Do you want their money? I don't, I'm not particularly interested in their money. I don't care. And you know what else? I don't even care if they don't believe what we believe. You don't have to believe what we believe. You can think this Christianity stuff is all nonsense. That's okay with me too. I just want to see the Holy Spirit at work in our church and touch the lives of people and transform them. Don't you want to see that? Now let me ask you something. Do you or do you not believe that over four weeks of time when we're praying, do you or do you not believe that somebody's going to get healed? Seriously. There is no doubt in my mind somebody's going to get healed. And you know the off shot is, the off chance is that maybe the person that gets healed is a person that you invite. And you know what are they doing? They're wasting one hour of their life. Who cares? If I'm messed up, I am quite willing to give one hour of my life to the off chance that Jesus might heal me. I'm willing to do it. So I'm challenging you this morning to do your small thing, and I mean it's about as small as it can get. I'm not even asking you to go out and pray for people. I'm just asking you to go out and say, when you come to church, somebody else will be there and they'll pray for you. We'll pray for you. And we don't want your money. We don't want you to believe, you don't need to believe. We just want you to come and we, we believe that maybe God, God will work in your life. That's all we want. I believe that's true. And you know, I believe that's the way he wants it. I'm glad that if you make 16, 14 meals for somebody else, that's very, very good. But, but the end result of that is that somebody says, Randy, you've done a great thing. Thank you for being such a wonderful person. And that's not my aspiration in life. I don't want people to say you're a wonderful person. What I want is for people to say you are a powerful, wonderful God. And the only way that people can come to that conclusion is, is if I do this much and God does this much. But the risk is, what if God doesn't show up? It's not my problem. My problem is my part. God's problem is his part. If he drops a ball, that's on him, not on me. I've got to do this much. I'm not concerned about people saying no to you. I'm concerned about you not stepping up. We're gonna, if this is a failure, it's not because people are saying no. It's because we don't have the guts. Am I getting in your face this morning? Good, because I wanted to make sure that it was very clear that I was getting in your face. If it wasn't clear enough, I wanted you to know that I was. I'm challenging you. I'm challenging you. The Lord wants us to do this. The Lord wants people to be healed. And you know what? It wouldn't hurt to pray for those services over the next couple of weeks. It's going to be October 22nd, first week, four weeks in a row. You know what Jesus one time said? Jesus said, I have come to help not the 
healthy people, but those who are sick. I've come to help the sick people. And I think that means we're all sick in some ways, and uh, we all have needs, but not all of us realize it. Some of us think, oh, I'm good to go. And I think what he was saying was, I, I, I'm just going to reach out to those people that realize they're messed up right now. That's what I think he's really saying, but if you take it at face value, what is he saying? He's saying, I'm coming, I came to help sick people. Everybody here in this room knows people that are sick. Sick physically, sick emotionally, sick relationally, sick. And have needs. And Jesus said, I've come for that. He's asking you, would you do this much? They don't have to join the church, give money, anything. Just ask them to come we want to pray for them. We won't embarrass them. Just ask them to come. That's your part. That's your part. Well, everybody here ought to have about 20 rejections. And every other person will have one yes. That's good enough. That would be amazing. You do your part. I'm not asking for much. I'm asking you to invite. That's all. Just invite. Somebody asked me when I said in first service, you can do it in all the services. I'm going to invite a guy from work to come. I said, yeah, it's all services. And you know what? If the person you invite, if the person you invite is a person that doesn't like contemporary music, then you know what you ought to do those weeks? You ought to go to the first service. And the people in the first service, you know what they ought to do? They ought to go to any of these services. It's not about you. It's about Christ. And you know what? If you don't know who to ask, one woman, one week when she was going out of church, Faye Weidenhammer, when she was going out of church, one week, shook her hand, I said, Hey, how are you today, Faye? She said, Randy. Now, she is now 75, and I think of her, I just love Faye, and she's wonderful. She's a wonderful Bible teacher, teaches on a Wednesday. I think Faye's great. I'm shaking her hand. She said, Randy, anybody over 70, if anybody over 70 says to you, when you ask them, how are you doing, if they say, I'm fine, they're lying. <laughs> she said, none of us are perfectly fine. So if you have no one you know to ask to come, if you don't know anybody sick, just go up to any 70-year-old <laughs> and say, hey. Go to, any, go to any senior citizen grouping and listen to the conversation around the table and what will they be talking about? This aches and that aches and this aches and that aches. Just stand outside this shooey senior citizen gathering and after whatever day they have it, just stand out there and say, hey, would you come? Because they're all aching. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> you got it? You got it? Now, I want to say every week, I'm going to pray a moment. If you hear God speaking to you in church today, if there's any need right now, we don't have to wait till October 22nd to pray for you. If you've never invited Jesus into your life before, there's always going to be somebody in my office waiting to pray for you. Okay, so you may want to go over there today and receive prayer today about whatever it is on your mind. Let me pray. Lord God, I thank you for the opportunity to play a small role. There's no more exhilarating thing than to play that small role and see you do gr your great thing. We thank you for the opportunity to play that small role. And I pray that you would sweep through this room a passionate enthusiasm and a conviction to invite, invite, invite people that are sick. So many people. Open our eyes to sickness, of any sort, sickness. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would be present so powerfully that the paint peels off the walls. You're just, just, shoo, powerful here. Pray for that. Jesus, just work. Work, work in the next couple of weeks. Work, work powerfully when Bob Lentz comes and brings his message. Work powerfully in those healing service weeks. Lord God, I just look forward to whatever you want to do because you got the Lord, look forward to it. And I pray that people would come. People would come and people would come, experience you and give praise to you. Not to the person that invited them. They did just 10% of it. Not to me speaking up front here, but to you. All glory and honor. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. The power source, the power source for all healing, the power source for life, all comes from one person. That's Jesus and his death and resurrection. And every so often, we just want to celebrate that. And one of the days we want to celebrate is right here, right now. It says this in the Word, Luke 22. When 
the time came. Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. Jesus said, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. And I tell you that we won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. And he said, take this and share it among yourselves, for we will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. And he took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it to pieces, gave the disciples and said, this bread is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. And after supper, supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. And so today we want to celebrate Jesus' gift and receive communion. Let me pray one more time as we prepare our hearts for that. Lord God, I... I just ask that you would anoint this time, this holy time, when we're going to receive communion. And I pray that you would, you would speak. I've talked a lot today. But there's going to be some silence here. There's going to be maybe music playing in the background or whatever, but there's silence. You've got the floor. You've got the floor when I'm up at the altar. You've got the floor in my life. Speak to me. Help me not to focus on anything that I have to do right now. Just help me hear you. Help us to hear you. Help us to be responsive to you. Just speak into our life about anything. If there's any dirt in our life that we need to deal with, Lord, reveal it to us. If there's any junk that's still junky in our life that lingers, Lord, we pray that you would help us to address that. But just, you got the floor right now. Speak. Holy Spirit, speak. Speak right now into our life and help us be responsive to confess sin or whatever else you want us to do. Speak right now. Your servants are listening as we receive communion today. In your name, amen. And Savior Jesus Christ, as we eat the bread, let's eat it with thanksgiving, because this represents Jesus' life that he gave for us. You may eat the bread. The wine which we hold in our hands represents the shed blood of Jesus Christ. If we drink it, let's drink it with, again, thanksgiving for his great and amazing gift of love and a desire that we be filled with his Holy Spirit to overflowing. We drink the wine. Let's pray. Lord God, we do thank you for your gift of love and sending your son Jesus into the world to die on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Um, if we absorb that reality into our minds and hearts, uh, I know I couldn't imagine who I would be or what I would be without you. We just thank you so much. And this life that you've given us post-salvation it's just a foretaste of what is going to be eternity with you. We thank you. We just thank you and praise you. And we pray that you would help us to live the rest of our days just doing the small things. That you might display yourself and your power and your majesty in a great, large, and amazing scale for others to adore you too. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's bring the band down here a little bit. And I, I want to do something a little different this morning before we leave here. Because we are all God's masterpiece. So I want you to repeat after me. I am God's masterpiece. God loves me no matter what I've done. No matter where I've been. God doesn't make junk. Dear Lord God, we thank you for this day and for this place to gather. And we thank you for your words, your words of encouragement, your words of confidence in knowing that we are your masterpiece. So Lord God, as we go through this week and we face some, some struggles, some tough times, may we always remember that we are your masterpiece and you have a great plan for us. So, Lord God, I just ask that you would encourage and strengthen us that whatever you put in front of us this week, 
no matter how small it is, that we just step out there in courage, knowing that all things with you are possible. Lord God, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for the death of Jesus, his shed blood for the forgiveness of our sins. And we just ask that you would be with us, keep us strong and healthy so that we can all come back and meet again and share in the joys that you provide. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week.